all. Hello, hello, hello. So you're very welcome to IFR 17, a deep dive on VFA and PAA. Uh, I'm Niall Norton in PwC. I'm a member of the Life Committee and I'm chair of the Life Financial Reporting Working Group, which has a focus on IFR 17. And today my job is just to introduce our speakers, which I'll do shortly, and help with the Q&A at the end. But first, a few bits of housekeeping. Uh, please put your phone on silent. And the 90 minute CPD uh, event today, so please sign the sign-in sheet, otherwise you're not here. We will be recording this meeting and the podcast and slides will be available online afterwards. And as with all our meetings, we do not record the Q&A after the presentation. And an extra feature today, as we've had at some recent events, is that it's being live streamed. Uh, so we have quite a number of people, I believe, that are registered to attend online. And they might actually be well positioned today to see the slides because we're in a long room today with a small screen. <laughs> So uh, the slides will be available afterwards. I would ask people hold their questions to the end, particularly for those um, looking at the live stream so that we can uh, feed them through accordingly. So today is a joint life and non-life deep dive event tonight for 17, our third in the series. And we have four speakers uh, to bring us through that. And I'll introduce them in speaking order. So to start, we have David McCurtain, uh, who works in Willis Towers Watson and has previously held a variety of commercial and actuarial roles in Dublin and London. Caroline Lynch will then follow, who works in Irish Life, where she leads their IFR 17 implementation. Joanne Lonergan uh, works in Deloitte, which her main focus over the last two years uh, around IFR 17, including a number of implementation projects. And last but not least, uh, Dara Pelly, who works in Raytig, a reg tech software company, and is heavily involved in IFR 17 implementation projects and delivering technology solutions. So without further fuss, uh, I'll hand over to David to kick us off. Now, so good morning, everybody. I'm, as Niall said, I'm David. I'm David McCurtain. Um, so we're under a little bit of time pressure. So I'm, what I'm going to do is kind of try and get through some introductory recap material for scene setting and get through that pretty quickly. I think in common with the others, you're going to see that we have probably more material as background that, that gets to sit there afterwards for sort of the, the library function, as it were. And so that there's that there to read afterwards for more detail. So we've got the usual uh, disclaimer in the competency framework, some of the society is putting through more and more nowadays, and we're designating this as being relevant to industry issues, functional and as well commercial awareness. I um, want to pause for a tiny moment on the working group membership, because obviously these people do, do, we, do you know, we, we do quite a bit of work and it's not just the faces in front of you, it's also the names in front of you, so all, all credit is due to everybody and uh, as you can see it helps if you're um, in the first half of the alphabet. Um, and so we've covered quite a bit of material, and this is back to the library function that I mentioned, I suppose, that these deep dive sessions and the prior sessions have covered a, quite a range of topics in the bullets here. And that's there for people to look back on over, I suppose, as we go through projects and so on and into the future over the next number of years. So it's quite good material there that I'd, I'd um, encourage people to look at. So then what we're... I suppose just to kind of take a tiny recap, what we're saying here is that in IFRS 17, there are three measurement models for measuring the policy liability, the insurance contract liability. The uh, default measurement model is the GMM, the general measurement model. And then, but today the point is to talk, Caroline will talk about the variable fee approach, the variable fee approach, and as well then we'll move on to the PA approach from Joanne and Dara. And the, I'm, what I'm going to do is talk briefly about uh, how we, what the decision tree is, how we end up using one or other model. And then I'm going to talk about uh, the general measurement model, just a quick recap on that. So firstly though, um, I suppose it's a burning question at the moment, of, um, what, what is the implementation date? And so I suppose we don't have a crystal ball, but we can sort of call out what we see. And so right now we're sort of in the middle of the screen here in the black box that the consultation and deliberation phase has been underway. Um, so we're looking probably at a final standard middle of next year, I think. Um, EFRAG at the same time are going through endorsement on that, uh, looking at uh, EU and then the EU approval process. So all of that leads towards uh, middle of next year, towards back end of next year into 2021. We sort of have an approved standard that, that is finalised and agreed by everybody. And then it becomes a matter of, well, when does it get implemented? And there are sort of two, two data points, I suppose, that are in conflict at the moment there, because the IASB has said... Um, very strongly, I suppose, when they had the original deferral of one year, that, look, it's one year, that's what it is. Uh, EFRAG, who are the advisory body in, the, in Europe, have recently said that um, a realistic implementation date is 1123, 
which is one year later. So they've come out and said that, but they've sort of talked about early adoption being possible as well. So, so it's, a, it's sort of a, there are the facts, um, and you sort of, we can draw a conclusion from that, and it's sort of a watch this space, we'll get um, clarity shortly, hopefully. So now, um, but irrespective of what data comes in, I mean, the fact is we're going to be using these medical models to be at 12 months sooner or later. So on the far side of the screen for me, so the general measurement model is the first one to talk about. What I'm doing here is I'm going to talk about what the logic is, the landscape for how we end up using one model or the other. So the first model on the far side is the general measurement model. That's the default in IFR 17, and the other models are in some fashion referenced from that. And so the general measurement model is used both at transition and then in live production, it's used in life insurance and in general insurance, so, so we'll all be seeing it. Then to start looking at the ones that we are going to be focusing on today, the deep dive, is to look at the variable fee approach and the other one. Firstly, the variable fee approach. Well, that, the thing to point out here is this is mandatory and it's a modification from the general measurement model. So it shares quite a bit of characteristics and features within Caroline, we'll go into detail on that. Um, that applies when we've got uh, the policyholder, and sorry, it's mandatory, I just want to emphasize that point, it's mandatory uh, in circumstances where the policyholder's benefits arise from an identifiable pool of sort of items or assets, and the insurer's obligation is to pay back those that as benefits or the less available fee. And then, so that's mandatory. And then nearer me on this side is the premium allocation approach. Okay, that's optional. Oh, and that's what Joanne and Dara will talk about. That's optional, but it's quite likely that all people would use the option when it's available to them. And so that's for a much shorter term business where the simplification uh, gives rise to a, a good approximation to the general measurement model. Okay, And it's quite a bit less effort than calculating the full CSM. And so it would sort of be disproportionate to go through all that effort to uh, just run a general measurement model for a such short term business. Now, if you're sort of like me, it's nice to understand the principles and the rules behind it and also then to sort of make it tangible. And so here we're calling out some of the product types that will fit in the different boxes. So on the far side, again, the general measurement model on uh, P&C, we're looking at multi-year cover. So this is long-term risk business. And so multi-year uh, motor, sort of adverse development covers, things like that. In life insurance land, it's things like a whole of life, sort of traditional products, annuities, protection, and so on. Then in the variable fee approach, which again, just to twig is mandatory, it's things like for an insurance land, it's the unit linked, it's with profits in the UK definition, certainly. Um, and then in the premium allocation approach, it's, as I said, that, that sort of shorter term business is an optional simplification, be that a lot of general insurance contracts, live contracts where they're, they're shorter term. So that, that sort of finishes up the, 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 how, the why, the logic of how we get into one or other model. Um, and now what I want to do is just spend a couple of minutes, and this is very quick, this is, this is sort of whistle-stop tour territory, just getting through the concepts and the jargon for those of us not hearing it on a daily basis or to set the scene for Caroline coming up now. So bear with me, this is, this is like bingo, I'm gonna hit all the words. So on the uh, general measurement model, uh, we have a present value of cash flows, which is quite familiar. And then we have on top of that, if you think about the liability stack, we have the risk adjustment, and then those give rise to the contractual service margin, which uh, nets off any profit at the outset, and so that doesn't get reported immediately. If the contract's actually loss making, get a loss component instead. So those are our building blocks, and I'm going to hit each of those with a tiny bit of info in turn. Uh, so the present value of cash flows, so what cash flows, how, what, what kind of cash flows? So it's, it's sort of best estimate, and it's perhaps stochastic modeling. It's supposed to be an unbiased set of cash flows. Um, there's quite a long list, and I'm certainly won't have time to get through those, but it's the benefit and claim cash flows, it's most expenses. What's probably not, in, or sorry, what's important to know what's not in there as well. Um, cash flows back and forth to a reinsurer. Investment returns aren't in there as well. That's an important thing to twig relative to IFRS 4, which we used to at the moment. That's, that's quite a change intentionally coming through in IFRS 17. Um, another one that's important to twig, I suppose, is the, the point that the expense assumption is going to be different from solvency 2 because there are some of the uh, non-attributable overheads uh, aren't in, intended to be in the scope here. Um, so then, next point, so what cash flows for how long? Um, so the cash flows within the contract boundary. Uh, here, it, it's very like solvency 2. The contract boundary, though, is there's a subtle difference, and we've got the little quote from Eope at the bottom of the screen. It's, there's a subtle difference where the entity has the uh, legal right to reprice, but not the practical ability to do so. So you're sort of into subtleties and meanings of words. So if you're thinking of solvency too, you're not too far off, basic understanding. Um, as we said, present value, 
so we are going to need a discount rate. So it's market consistent and we, again, as I said, it's potentially stochastic with options and guarantees and with the sort of asymmetric payoffs uh, needing to be valued. Uh, careful consideration will be needed here because there are a couple of approaches allowed and we do end up with a liquidity premium. So it is a matter of thinking through it and understanding the rules and justifying, trying to understand what the impacts are of this. And I suppose the point you made in this slide was that the two approaches, top down and bottom up, so bottom up coming from the risk free rate plus something, top down being what assets we have minus something for credit, I suppose, expected losses, and that the two don't really meet in the difference or in the middle sometimes they give a different answer. So that is the cash flows. So now we go on to the risk adjustment. Now this is different to the solvency two risk margin because this is the this is the entity's own view of the compensation required for bearing risk. Okay, so that makes it quite different from solvency two. Um, we've set out some of the differences here. Let's look reading them, and then just thinking about the uh, how you how you would go about calculating this. So there there are a number of approaches. I suppose right that the important point to point say here is that the rules don't actually specify how to do this at, at all. In fact, and so here are some of the approaches that people could use. People are looking at. The top one, cost of capital, well, that's quite familiar uh, from solvency two. It's, it, the methodology, at least, is, is uh, that will be familiar to people. The next one is the value at risk. I think that's relatively familiar as well. It's sort of for a given percentile, how bad does it look? Then the tail var, or uh, probably better name, the um, conditional tail expectation that once you're in the tail, what, oops, what does the average look like? So that definitely deserves a drum roll. And um, finally, I suppose the sort of colloquially named pad or provision for adverse deviation, that's maybe a little more familiar from um, IFRS 4 and prudent reserves and so on, so sort of given a little uh, addition on top of the best estimate assumption, uh, what would we end up needing to, to feel comfortable about covering the liabilities. So final building block, um, as I said, getting through the jargon here for naming for tutorial, but that the other parts we talked about give rise to the CSM, which is intended to net off any day one profit so that the profit doesn't get reported immediately. And instead, it will get dripped, in, in simple language, to get held aside and dripped into profit year by year in line with how services are delivered to customers. Um, important point to note, I suppose, that's different from the current world, is that an assumption change, a basic change for future service, uh, will not go to profit immediately, but instead adjust the CSM as buffered, and instead is dripped out, uh, and then over time, rather than coming through immediately. Uh, final point on the CSM is just to note that it's a, a calculation that, okay, certainly it arises from policies, but the CSM is held at a group level. Okay, so not a policy level, and it's managed at that level into the future. And remember, we will be holding this for quite a while into the future. And so the group is, is defined by looking at the three colored boxes on screen. So we've got the portfolio of similar risks managed together, profitability level, and when it was sold, an annual cohort max. So what we're thinking about here is something like, Oh, a particular line of business sold in 2018, highly profitable. Um, so that is the run through, just to give a very quick recap of what we said. So we've had a sort of a, there are three models. The general measuring model is the default that things reference from. And then Caroline is going to talk about the VFA, which is mandatory in certain circumstances. And then uh, we want to talk about the premium allocation approach, which is, is somewhat different. And uh, so it's going to be quite done. That's really the meat of the presentation that we're coming to now. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so thank you, David. And um, now we're going to move on to the variable fee approach. So um, a lot of words here. I'm not going to read them all out. Um, essentially, the variable fee approach uh, was developed based on feedback um, when the general measurement model was first um, being mooted, these building blocks, what would come through your CSM, um, and it was to address concerns that for some types of insurance contracts, where the payments are going to vary with the return on the underlying items, um, this could introduce accounting mismatch. So a difference between um, the accounted treatment of the investment gains and losses on the actual underlying items in your P&L compared to how they would be treated through that CSM, um, that liability. Um, so, as we said, it's not optional. If you meet the criteria, you must apply the VFA approach. Um, and we'll go on to what those uh, particular criteria are on the next slide. Um, it is probably fair to say that there can be some judgment involved in actually assessing a group of contracts to determine whether they do meet those three criteria to be classified um, or to be measured under the VFA. 
Um, and I suppose point to, to recall here, what we tend to be talking about then are unit link contracts that have some insurance risk. Um, so if we're meeting the eligibility criteria for VFA, um, you can view the entity's obligation as the net of an obligation to pay an amount equal to the fair value of some underlying items that have been defined um, and a variable free, less a variable fee that the entity is going to deduct for future service and um, providing that service. Um, so that could be the entity share of the fair value, I, our AMCs that we're going to deduct annually um, and then also fulfillment caches that don't vary based on the returns of the underlying items. Um, so for example, if we have a GMDB and we're, we're um, or a guaranteed minimum death benefit, which could exceed the fund value, we have some non-unit um, uh, fulfillment cash is there. Um, there are some options. We're not. Um, there are some options on policy account, um, on accounting policy choices for the presentation within the financial statements. We'll touch upon a few of those later. But um, I suppose the aim here today really is to talk through the measurement model. Um, so I'm preparedly focused on that um, rather than the explicit um, accounting um, position of the items. Um, and then there's some other um, accounting policy choices as well. Um, just a quick note before we move on. Um, we all talk about IFRS 17. We know that, that relates to insurance contracts, those contracts and containing significant insurance risk. Um, the one additional group of contracts um, that IFRS 17 scope applies to are investment contracts with discretionary participation features. And if you've got these contracts that meet that criteria, you then apply your IFRS 17 standard, you essentially read insurance contracts to include those contracts. Um, you'd have to do an assessment as to what model they would come under, but it's quite likely because of the types of contracts you're talking about that they may meet the VFA criteria. Um, so on this side, uh, just seeing um, in the gray boxes, um, the three criteria that you need to meet um, in order to apply VFA. Um, so your policyholder has um, to contract to participate in a clearly identified pool of underlying ad assets. Um, that could be your unit linked funds, it could be net assets of the company or a subset of assets of the entity. Um, the insurer does not need to hold those assets, um, but they have to be identified within the contract. Um, and it doesn't preclude having um, discretion, the entity to have discretion around the amounts paid, um, but again it has to be a, a, an enforceable link. Um, for it to be under the VFA. Um, and then on the other two criteria, um, so we're looking at policies that are, um, they may be insurance contracts, but a substantial share of the returns on the underlying items um, will be allocated to the policyholder. Um, and then we also have to have the case that um, any changes in the policyholder benefits, um, what's that? that the policyholder benefits will substantially vary um, with the change in the underlying items. Um, so if we take an example again, that unit link contract with maybe a GNDB, a minimum death benefit, um, the policyholder's share, when we're assessing that, um, we look at it on a probability weighted basis. Um, so there may be particular scenarios where their, um, the guarantee never bites, so their, their benefit will always vary with the underlying items 100%, but there will be some scenarios where that guarantee will bite and the policyholder benefit doesn't vary. Um, so in assessing this, you're looking at um, these two criteria, you're looking at overall scenarios um, and not just a best or worst case scenario. Um, and then in terms of um, just on that piece, the returns on the underlying, we might be thinking, well, when we start deducting our fixed charges, how much of that is flowing to the policyholder? So in assessing that second criteria, um, you actually, you, you look at before deducting those, you can look before deducting those uh, mortality charges or other cost of insurance charges um, in applying the criteria. Another fundamental point is um, that you cannot apply the VFA to reinsurance contracts. So what I've discussed there, you might think there can be um, financial risk mitigation contracts, reinsurance contracts that um, would function very similar to this. You could view it as a pass through of yours to the insurer. The reinsurer, um, that is clearly defined within IFRS 17, you cannot apply the VFA measurement model to a reinsurance contract, either issued or held. Um, so, as um, so, so you've seen the slide uh, briefly previously, um, so on initial recognition when we're looking at setting up an insurance contract liability, um, the VFA um, looks extremely like a GM, the GMM. Um, so the point to focus on is um, it's really an adaptation <coughs> of the GMM. It's still this building block approach. You're still looking at your fulfillment cash flows. You're looking at them on a present value basis. Um, you're looking at then setting up a risk adjustment for those non-financial risks um, and you're 
then looking at setting up a CSM, if that is a, a PV as a profit. Um, where this differs, and we'll go through this in more detail um, subsequently, um, where this differs to the general measurement model is what elements come through that CSM as you roll it forward versus what elements would come directly through your P&L. Um, so just to, I suppose, pause before we start getting into that roll forward, um, on initial recognition, it is the same as the uh, GMM initial recognition. We've looked at, um, so it's a bit in the dotted um, piece on the graph, um, that is looking at our sort of traditional view there. We've got our cash flows, we've discounted, we've set up a risk adjustment. Um, we also take into account then um, some pre-recognition cash flows, if there are any. So these could be um, attributable acquisition cash flows that haven't been captured in our, in our um, fulfillment cash flow calculation. Um, when all of that is done in this example, um, we have a, a profit, a PV risk adjusted profit of 30. Um, so in our, if we're reporting under IFRS 4, um, we may bring that PV of profit through our accounts at present, um, and then any future um, changes to it will come through our accounts. Under IFRS 17, um, we have to uh, zeroize that, um, so that's this concept of the contractual service margin. So that's our view of the, cur the, the PV of profits. We now defer that and we're going to recognize it over the period that we provide service to the um, insured. Um, so we set up a liability and that's zero as our p and um, So again, just to recap, um, obviously there, there was a session back in, I think it was the end of April, uh, which walked through in a lot of detail the general measurement model. Um, I just wanted to include this slide um, to um, kind of give us a quick overview of all the movements um, once we have set up that initial CSM, how for one group might that roll forward. Um, we'll then focus on what the differences are for the VFA, um, which is down to two particular elements here, and then um, um, look as well if we have a loss component. Um, so quick recap, um, just taking this example, we have an opening CSM, and um, we have new business going in. Now, we have to form cohorts. Those cohorts can be a max of a year. So it is possible that you might have um, quarterly calculated your CSM, then have another quarter's new business um, flowing into that same group. And um, for that new business, you do your initial recognition calculation as you would have done previously, add your 30. Um, we then uh, move to the next step. So under general measurement model, we accrete interest on the balance of the CSM. Um, that is accreted at a locked-in rate. So that rate gets set once the cohort has been established um, and doesn't then vary in future as um, experience varies. So in this example, we're just adding an, another 20 to our balance. Um, then we bring through changes for future service. So these could be positive or negative. Um, and these, again, are measured under the general measurement model on that locked-in rate. And so for five, 10 years down the line um, with an established cohort, current view of discount rates could differ significantly to um, your view five years ago, um, or the market consistent view five years ago. Um, and again, and for the general measurement model, the elements that come through um, the CSM here are uh, for future service, are um, non-financial risks. Um, then we would bring through any um, impact of um, a change in um, exchange rates on the CSM. When we do that, we've got a balance and then we're going to actually recognize some of that balance. So we reduce this CSM and bring a piece of that through our P&L um, in the period and that's our, our profit um, contribution from the CSM. So I'm not sure you're going to be able to read this at the back. <laughs> so what we want to do is just look at, well, what does differ then under the VFA in the subsequent measurement and um, what are the elements that may come through differently? Um, so to focus on, I suppose the first one is a question, um, the amortization of the CSM into the P&L. So how much of the balance do you release? That is going to depend upon the view of how much service you have provided under the contract um, in this period compared to the present value or non-discounted view of all the future um, service you would be providing under the contract. Um, I'm sorry, I'm saying contract here, you're looking at this for a group of contracts, um, your one cohort. Um, so that may be the same um, if you uh, depend, well, sorry, probably won't be the same actually. Um, so under VFA, you will be taking account, uh, because these are substantially investment related insurance contracts, you need to take account of the um, investment related service when you're looking at how much service would you be providing in a period 
compared to future periods, um, as well as looking at insurance service. Um, if you had a different contract which didn't meet your VFA criteria, but did have an element of an investment, um, an investment component, you would take account in the amortization under the proposed exposure draft in June, you could take account of both insurance and the investment return service. Um, in terms of elements that differ, um, we've talked on the, VF, on the JMM, we apply interest accretion at this locked in rate. And um, the key concept here is under the VFA, you are not locking in a rate. Um, so you actually don't explicitly accrete interest, but you will bring through the effective time value of money um, on your fulfillment cash flows. Um, so both the entity's share of the underlying kind of PV of the income, as well as the other uh, non-varying um, with the underlying um, fulfillment cash flows. Um, and then the other piece, again, is um, under the GMM, we're bringing through only changes in non-financial assumptions um, that relate to future um, service. Under the VFA, we will bring in changes for both financial and non-financial assumptions. Um, and then on a kind of disclosure point, um, under VFA, we do have the option to, um, to combine some of these movements in, in our disclosure. Um, so this graph looks very similar to what we've looked at for the GMM. Um, and it's just to, to kind of flow through. The two elements that have changed are really the two at the top there. So rather than interest accretion, we're looking at an entity share. And well, the other element is the same. It's changes for future service, but it's what's defined as being allowed in there. And um, so we'll just step through that now. Um, again, say we have an opening balance, um, 60 in this example. Um, we're within one year, we're using annual cohorts, we write some new business. So we add, um, we do our full initial recognition calculation there and add 30 to the CSM balance. So now we um, look at what's the change in our um, share of the fair value. Um, in this example, plus 20, um, that flows through our CSM. Um, we then look at um, any changes for future service. Um, so that's going to be the changes in any of the fulfillment cash flows that don't vary with the underlying because we've already brought them through in the previous step. Um, so both the effective time value of money and any experience variance um, for future financial or non-financial, um, so any sorry, basis changes for financial or non-financial assumptions. Um, similar to before, our CSM balance will be adjusted for any change in for, um, exchange rates. And then we need to recognize a portion of that. So at this point, you would look at what's my new CSM balance just before the end of the period. Um, and then I'm going to amortize a bit of that to get my closing balance. Um, so when we're talking about coverage in this example, um, I've just said, let's assume there's one coverage unit relates to now and um, the kind of present value of our view of future coverage units are three. So we bring through one third, that's our 20 coming through. Um, there's different methods that can be used to, uh, rec to, to kind of define your coverage units and um, what they need to do is recognize the service being provided. Um, so one example for a kind of unit link contract with a, again, a, a sum assured, um, which might exceed that unit linked um, element would be the maximum of the, the unit value and the sum assured. Um, and you want to look at, you would need to look at that now and then look at your view of that over every future period. Um, in order to understand your kind of numerator and denominator and um, to recognize your portion of CSM. Um, so, I mean, another option would be just simplify it, use policy count, expect a policy count. Um, and then as well, there's an option within the standard, you can choose to discount or not to discount when you're defining your um, coverage units. And so there's quite a bit of optionality there in, in, in coverage units. Um, you then come to your closing CSM. So um, in this example, I have closing CSM, 40 and um, that's going to that's representing then the remaining risk adjusted profits that I have to recognize over the future service of the contracts and um, so this is really just a, a re recap and um, I so the key point to just make is we've been talking about this it's all um, being positive so you do need to apply a zero floor you cannot have this negative CSM um, and we'll come to that in a second um, and then, as we've said, you can actually combine some of these movements. So I suppose in particular that one around our entity share and the, the kind of remaining um, liability, we might actually be quantifying that in, in one step. 
Um, so what does happen if that zero floor bites? Um, so we're deferring future profits, but under IFRS 17, if a loss is identified, you bring that immediately uh, through your p and um, And then you actually need to track that over time to understand how much loss you have brought through for that particular group um, or cohort, um, because there might be future beneficial experience which could offset some of those losses. Um, so just to illustrate that point here, um, if we've got um, a loss component could arise on initial recognition. So actually, when we um, look at the PV of our cash flows, we add that risk adjustment, we take account of any um, other um, relevant cash flows, um, we might actually find that we have a loss component. Um, so that loss component is um, comes through our P&L initially. Um, I suppose it is risk adjusted profits, so we might have some pads there that, you know, if things do happen as expected, we're expecting to release those. Um, probably worth just recalling that point. Um, the other area where this will arise is um, we've had an open, we have a positive uh, CSM balance, we've got some pro profits, um, but actually for, for one of those elements that comes through our CSM, um, so we have a significant um, basis change um, and it, um, it actually might offset all of that CSM. So the impact of bringing through that strengthening essentially of reserves um, through your, the change of fulfillment cash flows um, reduces your CSM and makes it negative. So in this example, I've got a, a CSM of uh, minus 30, um, which then becomes a loss component of 30 and that excess hits the P&L um, in that period. Um, so again, now we actually need to track that. Um, so if we walk through this example, um, initially, um, we've um, recognized a loss um, component and brought, uh, say, 60 through P&L. Um, over the next period, um, we're going to be incurring claims. Um, as they emerge, um, we actually will be um, partially reducing um, because a component of, of the claim and um, the excess claim that we've incurred has actually been brought through, the loss com through as part of the loss component. Um, here, we're reducing it um, by 10. And um, how you do that could differ. Um, you could try to utilize a similar approach to your coverage units, um, but you do need to recognize that. And um, the reason you need to keep track of how much of that loss component um, still remains is if you then have, for example, a positive basis change, which would more than offset that remaining loss component, you cannot bring that uh, through your P&L. You can only bring through the amount to offset the loss component. And then you now have to kind of re-establish or establish for the first time a CSM for that group. Um, so, so I said, that's very focused on, on one cohort, uh, one group of contracts and what might arise. Um, just before moving on, I wanted to, um, I suppose, flag the um, profit emergence under IFA 17. So from an entity's perspective, um, I think we're quite familiar with some of these areas, um, we might expect a release of the risk adjustment um, over time, if experience emerges as expected. Um, we're also again gonna have this release of CSM under our IFA 17 world. Um, so that will be released for each, each group that we're holding a CSM. Um, we then also have some experience for variance or noise coming through in quarter. Um, and then at an entity level, um, any of those expenses that were, were not attributable will also um, flow through. Um, so there was a, um, a bit more detail provided um, in the deeper dive to the general measurement model, which I'm not going to go through today because we also want to cover the PAA. Um, but it is worth referring back to um, for the, the kind of following two concepts, I think. Um, so I suppose the first one is around this level of aggregation. So um, we've been talking about groups um, and David touched briefly upon like the fact that we will have portfolios of similar risk and managed together. Um, there could be multiple products in, in those portfolios. Um, we have to form annual cohorts. We can't include contracts more than a year apart in one cohort. Um, that could be shorter. You could choose to do quarterly cohorts. Um, you'll have four times the number of groups and CSMs to track if you do that. Um, and then there's three different profitability groups. So either it appears onerous on initial recognition and we have that loss component situation. It may appear non-onerous on initial recognition. We set up a CSM. Um, but there's actually three profitability groups. Um, so one profitability group then would be as well, if it appears non-onerous and you have no, there's no um, significant um, probability of it becoming onerous subsequently. So essentially very profitable, profitable, not profitable on a risk adjusted basis. Um, so you've got those, those three groups. 
Um, so I suppose just the, the um, in terms of profit emergence, the reason that um, I suppose pause on level of aggregation is you might have um, numerous products within that one portfolio that are that you manage as one um, and are similar risks, and you might be um, setting up a CSM then for sort of two or three different products within the one group. Um, you will have coverage units for those two or three products. Um, once you've established your initial CSM, the progression of that CSM will then be dependent upon the overall experience of that group. Um, so um, kind of depending upon essentially how much CSM you establish at outset versus how much coverage units um, relate to that, that product at outset, um, if they differ between those products, you could actually have quite uh, an impact on your um, profit profile profit emergence profile. Um, so like I said, I'll just refer to this and then refer anyone back to the uh, general measurement model slides which are available on the website um, if it's an area you want to take a look at. Um, so then just to um, kind of comment on the other area that affects the, um, the release of that CSM in terms of our coverage units. Um, so we have to reflect service that we're providing. Key element here um, under these contracts again is that it's investment and insurance related service. Um, so it needs to reflect the quantity of the benefit we could pay the policyholder. It's not just our expected actual claim payments to the policyholder. It should reflect how much we stand to pay at any point in time. Um, there's some comments there on what's, what's not valid um, from the standard. Um, the other point I just wanted to make was um, that you're reassessing those coverage units at each point. So when we get to that closing uh, balance of CSM just before we amortize it, we then go and recalculate our coverage units because the value of those coverage units will have moved over time. Um, so every time we're looking at how much is the current value for the service we've now provided in this period versus the current, our expected value of those coverage units um, for every future period that we're standing ready to um, pay claims. Um, so now I just want to move on to an illustrative example. Um, so this is, um, we'll walk through the detail of it. Um, clearly, um, either the general measurement model uh, will apply or the VFA will apply. What I want to look at here is though the difference that we would see if we applied the same models to the product. So really to observe the reason why the VFA was um, brought in. And um, if we just take this example, it's, uh, we're just going to say it's a unit linked product. Um, we're going to have um, a premium of 105, and we're going to allocate to the unit fund 100. Um, we incur some acquisition expenses. Um, we're going to um, charge the policyholder 2% uh, per annum um, AMCs. So we've got a present value of charges there, um, about 17, 18K. Um, we, under this product, we're saying we'll have a GMDB of 105% of the premium back to the policyholder on death. So we're going to establish a liability then for that um, GMDB. Um, so uh, 5,000 here, um, and then we establish a risk adjustment. So after all of that is done, um, on our initial recognition, we have a CSM of just over 14,000. Um, so other points to note are uh, my coverage units assumption. So um, what we're showing here, um, we're assuming that actually we're, we're standing, um, we're um, having equal coverage units um, over each future period. Um, so essentially we're looking at the um, a uniform um, coverage. So in the first year, we're providing one unit of coverage. Um, it's a 10-year contract. So in total, we would expect to be providing 10 coverage units. Um, and then just to, I'm, um, I suppose, the other part of this then obviously is our unit fund. So um, we've looked at our CSM and then we'll also have our unit liability of that 100K. Um, we are assuming here we've got assets to match that. So this is something that's invested into Unilink Fund. We've got the Unilink Fund there. Um, so those two elements, um, they do not relate to um, future service and they, um, any movement in that unit liability, that current fair value that we owe the policyholder um, or obligations to the policyholder, any movements in that come directly through your P&L. But likewise, any movements then in your unit funds that you're holding will come through your P&L. Um, so, what does it look like? Um, so I hope people can actually see this at the back, um, or at least see some of the difference. Um, so under this one, the dark bars there is our general measurement model. Um, and what we're looking at is our CSM balance. So this is a CSM balance shown at the beginning of each period. Um, so at time one there on the CSM balance up on the left, 
we're basically setting up the same CSM regardless of if it's GMM or VFA. Um, and then that CSM balance is running off over time. Um, <coughs> similar runoff, um, not exactly the same um, under the two measurement models. Um, and that's in part down to um, the method of applying interest accretion at a locked in rate under the um, GMM. This is our 5%. Um, or sorry, I should have just paused and said. So throughout this, I'm assuming, um, we're assuming our expected return of 5% is our market consistent um, return and we're discounting at that rate. So under the, C under the GMM, we apply that 5% to that CSM balance. We're going to then amortize a piece of that CSM balance in the next period. We're going to apply 5% to that remaining balance. Um, differs slightly to the VFA because under the VFA, we're going to um, bring through the change in our share of the underlying, so the change in the PV of fee income. Um, so in the first period, that's, that's the same value. Um, we'll also bring through the change in the value of the GMDB liability to the CSM. Um, and, then we will, and then we will amortize part of that um, CSM. As we move forward, there's a slight divergence just down to um, the compounding impact um, that we would have um, because the closing balance will not completely because you're amortizing one one ninth of it it will not be equal to the full change in the fair value um, and that difference will come through your PL under the GMM approach um, so what we're seeing here is earnings profile is fairly stable um, and that's reflecting the fact that I've set coverage units to be equal coverage over each period and um, so it's the really interesting piece is if we move on and look at what happens when there's a market um, or financial risk related stress. So in year three, um, let's just assume that our underlying items, instead of returning our 5%, they return minus 10%. Um, and we're also making another important assumption here that we have not hedged or um, put reinsurance for financial risk in place um, against um, either our fee income or the, the GMDB um, liability, um, which I'm calculating disaggregate. disaggregate. Um, in, this, in this example. Um, so under the GMM approach, our CSM runoff is not affected um, by financial risk. So it's actually the same runoff profile as we just had on the previous slide. Um, and then if you see what comes through in your earnings in year three, um, you bring through that, that change to financial risk. So you bring through the fall in the PV of um, charges and you actually get a loss then in your PL. Um, whereas under the VFA, the CSM balance um, drops there. So that drop is happening just at the end of year three when we, um, so we're showing the opening balance of year three and then the opening balance of year four in my graph. So that fall then, uh, is it the CSM falling to absorb the movement in the change in the PV of fee income and the change in the GMDB liability? Um, and then what you see is that your light blue line on the earnings, it has fallen, but it's, it's kind of, it's still quite level over the remaining service. So again, that's that loss essentially being deferred and recognized over the remaining period of service. Um, so, um, so this is great. The, the uh, VFA has done what we expected it to do. It's reduced the accounting mismatch, um, case closed, I suppose, um, except um, we made an important assumption that we are not hedging our financial risk. Um, from an economic point of view, we probably would like to hedge our, um, our financial risk. Um, so um, we will go to a, a new graph, but first um, let's talk about um, an important option to address um, the situation where we might be hedging um, under IFR 17, um, applying specifically for VFA. Um, and that is the risk mitigation exception. Um, so probably rather than read through the words, I'll show you the graph, it might be <laughs> easier to see. Um, but um, essentially, um, we've, we cannot measure, um, so it's at the top of this graph, we're looking at our standard VFA p &L. Our CSM is adjusted for the changes in the time value of money and for financial risk, the effect of financial risks. Um, however, in terms of our p &L treatment, if we're holding a hedge instrument and we report fair value through p &L, then the change in um, the, value, the fair, fair value of the instrument comes directly through our p &L in the period it occurs. Um, and likewise, um, for a reinsurance um, asset we might hold, um, you, cannot, um, you cannot apply VFA to reinsurance. So the change due to financial risk will come immediately through your PL. So that creates this disconnect. 
um, and what the risk under the risk mitigation exception, um, we will be able to um, not bring changes that relate to a financial risk that's mitigated through our CSM. Um, so it's there to reduce the accounting mismatch. And um, I suppose just in terms of um, within the standard, there are quite specific criteria then that you need to meet um, in order to apply that. And um, so they're towards the end of the slide. Um, essentially, um, one point to note is that it's actually since uh, the exposure draft in June 2019 and um, did um, take in the change to extend this to reinsurance held on foot of industry feedback. Um, previously, it would have just been to hedge instruments. Um, so in order to apply it, you need to assess your instrument. You need to look and say and see, does the entity have a documented risk management objective and strategy for the product um, that this is um, performing? Um, it needs to be an economic offset. Um, and it can't be credit risk, that's the main risk that's mitigated. Um, and then just one other, um, I suppose, point, um, two other elements, I suppose, that are, uh, that are um, come, come through in the latest um, draft of IFR 17. Um, so that is, um, previously you had to apply your risk mitigation on the date of implementation, um, but you might be actually calculating your transition value before the date of implementation. Um, so you could have had this accounting mismatch then for the, the time in between. So um, there's a proposal to allow you to apply it prospectively from the transition date. Um, and there's also um, a proposal to allow entities to choose to apply a fair value transition approach um, for VFA groups where you are electing to use risk mitigation um, at the transition date. Um, whereas, uh, so sorry, even if you could do the um, full retrospective calculation. So generally uh, the principle under IFRS 17 is it's, it's applicable full, um, full retrospective. If you have the data you need to go and apply it retrospectively to your previous years and um, this is an option for VFA groups where you have the where you're going to have this risk mitigation, risk mitigation option to use a fair value approach. Okay, and then I suppose finally now, before we move on to the PAA, I just wanted to wrap up with what, um, what does then our VFA example look like if we have hedged the risk? Um, so here um, we're, we've assumed just that we've hedged the uh, financial risk on the GMDB. Um, so in year three, when we have our fall in markets and we increase our GMDB liability, um, we, no longer um, bring that impact through our CSM balance. So, um, so sorry, so for the light blue line um, where we're, we're using the risk mitigation, we no longer bring that impact through our balance. And um, so what we see is the CSM balance, it does still fall. Um, and that's because I've assumed we've only applied risk mitigation to the GMDB. So the CSM is still falling for the um, change in the PV of our fee income. Um, and then in, our, in terms of our earnings profile, our light blue line, um, which is what we want to get to, it's applying a risk mitigation option. So again, we have a drop in earnings, um, but the earnings are, are then relatively stable um, at that lower level. Um, whereas if we have hedged our GMDB financial risk, but we have not elected to use the risk mitigation option, then our CSM balance um, falls as it did previously um, in our example, falls for both the impact on the GMDB and the PV of our fee income. Um, and then we see our less stable earnings. So, I mean, in this situation, we've had a market fall, so actually we've had a hedge gain. Um, so we've got earnings, looks great, but if it was the other way around, obviously we'd have a loss there. So, um, so this three just did, I did illustrate um, the um, importance of I suppose, assessing the balance sheet in aggregate when you are looking at um, these options under the standard. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap up and hand over to Joanne to bring you through the PIA. Um, so I suppose at this stage, we've gone through um, two out of three measurement models. So the last one left to do is the premium allocation approach. Um, so I suppose this is a simplified version of the general measurement model. Um, and it's primarily used for short-term life contracts, I guess, and then primarily for non-life contracts, obviously, as well. Um, I think there's probably a general sense in the market that the PA is probably so similar to existing practices, there's not a lot of challenges associated with it. Um, I'm not sure in practice that's really the case, so I'll try and bring out some of the challenges um, with the PA here today. 
I think the, the main thing to remember is that the PA uh, is only to do with the liability for remaining coverage. So the simplification is only for your unexpired portion of your liability. So your expired portion, um, your liability for incurred claims is the exact same under the building block approach and the premium allocation approach. So there's no simplification allowed there. So I suppose um, the graph on this slide here really shows um, the simplification in terms of the liability for remaining coverage. So you can see in the left hand side of the slide here, um, under the building block approach, you have um, the very familiar four blocks, including your CSM, uh, and the premium allocation approach then on the right hand side is primarily made up of your, your premium received or UPR, less any acquisition costs that you have. So obviously two metrics that are, are pretty familiar. And just to remind ourselves as well, as David said at the start, um, if you meet eligibility criteria for the, for the VFA, you have to use a VFA, whereas that's not obviously the case under the premium allocation approach, it is optional. Um, so I suppose just to look then at how the liability differs between the PA and the building block approach then over the life of the contract. So you can see on the left hand side here at day zero, um, we just have a liability for remaining coverage because obviously everything is related to unexpired risk. Um, so your building block approach is your, your four usual blocks there, your future cost shows, your discounting, your risk adjustment and your CSM. Whereas your premium allocation approach then is just met up with your two items of UPR and your acquisition costs. Um, I think two things to note here. The first thing is that the quantum of the liability is the exact same under both models which basically tells you that the PEA should be an approximation of the building block approach. It should lead to the, pretty much the same answer. The other thing is the definition of acquisition costs. So obviously that's something that people are very familiar with under current IFRS 4, but it's just the definition of acquisition costs under IFRS 17 is a lot narrower than under current IFRS 4, so just something to bear in mind there. Um, so as we move then uh, during the coverage period, we can now see that our liability is broken up into two parts. So our liability for remaining coverage for unexpired risk and our liability for incurred claims then for expired risk. So as I said before, we can see that the uh, expired portion, your liability for incurred claims, is the exact same under both models. So you have your fulfillment cost shows, your discounting and your risk adjustment, the exact same under both models. The difference then arises then again when it comes to your liability for remaining coverage. Um, if we move then to the end of the coverage period, we can see that we no longer have a liability for remaining coverage because obviously we've no uh, unexpired risk remaining and everything is related to expired risk. So at this point, we're just left with a liability for incurred claims. Um, and just something to note here is that we're still left with a risk adjustment at the end of the coverage period because uh, the risk adjustment is, I suppose, uh, runoff over the settlement pattern, so in line with the, li the claims liabilities, rather than over the coverage period. Um, so I suppose the main difference between the two models really is that measurement of the liability for remaining coverage, but there are a couple of nuances that I suppose we should be uh, aware of as well with the premium allocation approach. So. If you look at discounting, first of all, there are a number of simplifications under the premium allocation approach for discounting. Um, the first one is around the liability for remaining coverage. So if a contract does not have a significant financing component, then you don't actually have to discount the liability for remaining coverage under the PAA. So I suppose when we say a significant financing component, we mean that if the time between premiums being due and coverage being provided is less than a year, then you do not have a significant financing component in that case. Looking at the liability for incurred claims then, so you don't actually have to discount the liability for incurred claims if the time between actually incurring the claim and settling the claim is less than a year. Um, one kind of, I suppose, complexity around that LFIC discounting there is that if you have a contract where, say, some of the claims are settled within one year and some of them are settled in more than a year, then you know, can you use that simplification then or not? So there is a bit of a bit of a gray area there in terms of the materiality of claims which meet that meet that criteria. Uh, the second area then is around your insurance acquisition cash flows. Um, so if your coverage period is less than a year, uh, then you can actually decide whether or not you want to recognise expenses or your sorry your acquisition costs uh, as expenses when they're incurred, or whether you want to actually amortise them over the over the coverage period. Um, so I suppose a lot of companies already have a mechanism in place for amortizing acquisition costs. 
But again, I suppose the key difference here is that the definition of that acquisition cost will be different. Uh, and I suppose another thing to think about then is what impact would choosing to amortize your acquisition costs have on your onerous test? So, you know, if, if you say decide to defer your acquisition costs over the coverage period, that would actually reduce your LF4C and potentially increase then the loss components that you would actually have to recognize on your P&L. So it's just something to be aware of when you're making that choice. Um, the final area then, uh, sticking with onerous contracts, um, one of the key principles under IFRS 17 is that uh, you can't offset profitable contracts with onerous <laughs> contracts. You do actually have to um, separate them out, report them separately within your disclosures, and also recognize any loss component uh, on your P&L immediately. So I suppose a lot of companies would have mechanisms in place already to monitor the onerosity of contracts, but probably not at the level of granularity that IFRS 17 would require. Um, so one difference in this particular area between the PA and the BBA um, is that you don't actually have to carry out an explicit onerous test at initial recognition. Uh, if you, you only have to uh, recognize onerous contracts if facts and circumstances indicate that they are onerous. So obviously there's a lot of judgment required here as to what, how you define those facts and circumstances. Um, so it's those metrics that companies are looking at or say pricing loss ratios, plan loss ratios, looking at historic experience um, and so on. And the final thing to note here then is that, you know, if you're a group of contracts and the PEA does become onerous during your coverage period, um, you do then have to calculate that loss component as a difference between your LF4C under the BBA and the PEA. Um, so just a quick recap in terms of how the PEA is actually uh, calculated. So at initial recognition, it's just your, your premium received, less your acquisition costs, um, plus any onerous loss that you're actually recognizing. Um, and then at each subsequent reporting period, you change this for any further premiums received, um, if you decide to, say, amortize your acquisition cash flows, allow for discounting, um, and obviously then recognizing amounts, so, or sorry, a portion of that LF4C as insurance revenue um, for each reporting period. Um, so moving on then to the eligibility criteria for the PA. Um, so I suppose if you have a contract with a coverage period of one year or less, then there's no testing required. You're just automatically eligible for the PA and you don't have to do any proving around that. Um, if you do, however, have contracts that have a coverage period of more than one year, um, if you can prove that LF4C under the PA gives a very similar answer to the LF4C under the building block approach, um, then you can also use the PA in this case. So I suppose the standard doesn't explicitly ask for you to carry out a test to show this, but I mean, majority of your stakeholders will expect some sort of validation in this area. So, so really, I suppose it is really a requirement, an implicit requirement. Um, so moving on then to, to the eligibility testing. Um, so I suppose, as I said, there's not really any defined structure in the standard as to how exactly you might go about doing this eligibility testing but I've just tried to outline kind of four of the main steps that I think um, might be helpful in, in doing this eligibility testing. So I suppose the first step there is around determining your materiality threshold. So say if you come up with, um, you do your test and you, you come up with the difference of 10% between your LF4C under the BBA and the PEA. So does that mean that it has passed the test or it's failed the test? So I suppose that's up for you to define. Um, if you have, say, a very immaterial contract um, that is not a large proportion of your gross premium, that has pretty stable claims experience over, say, the two-year uh, coverage period, then you might say, I'm okay with 10%, I'm happy to accept that. Whereas if, you, on the other hand, you had a contract, say, an engineering contract um, that ran over three or four years, had very volatile claims, claims experience, and was actually a significant portion of your gross premiums, then you might be less willing to accept that 10% deviation. Um, I suppose the other thing to consider then is that obviously all these policy decisions are going to be run by your auditors at some point in time. So when you're setting this materiality threshold, it's a pretty good idea to get the auditor's um, opinion as to what they will be willing to accept. And I suppose they will also then have a, a sense as to what other companies in the markets are doing to set that materiality threshold. Uh, the second step then is to perform your eligibility scoring. So we know our eligibility test is the difference between the LF4C under the BBA and the PEA. 
So I suppose you can look at that difference in terms of an actual monetary amount or as a percentage. And that percentage could be a percentage of discounted profit or it could be maybe a, a percentage of your BBA LF4C. So I suppose you do have some optionality there. And I suppose in terms of your types of scoring then that you're carrying out, so you could look at the average difference, which would give you a good sense as to how the LF4C develops over the entire coverage period. Or you could look then at the maximum difference, which gives you an idea then of any outliers um, in those differences between the BBA and the PAA. It's also a good idea to do some sensitivity testing around your eligibility test. So say if you change your loss ratio, if you increase it by 5%, change your expense assumptions, your discount curve, would that contract still meet eligibility test criteria uh, in that case? Um, third step then is just decide whether or not um, you're going to use the PA or the BBA, obviously with reference then to that scoring mechanism and to that materiality threshold. Um, so I think there are a few more factors than that that companies would normally consider. I mean, even if they, even if they meet eligibility criteria, there, there are other considerations which we'll come to a bit later on. Um, and the final step then is to just review your eligibility. So I suppose, say if you have a motor contract that you wrote in underwriting year 2018, um, if when it comes to underwriting year 2019, do you need to repeat that test again? Or can, does the test from underwriting year 2018 still stand? So I suppose, you know, a couple of things to think about here is, well, are the contracts written on the same terms and conditions, covering the same risks? Um, and I suppose, have any economic assumptions that might impact the result of your owner's test changed? So any kind of yield curve movements, any FX movements, uh, change in your risk adjustment calibration and so on. Um, so as I said, there's probably more to consider when you're deciding whether or not to go with PA than just, you know, have I passed the eligibility test? Um, and over the next couple of slides, I'm just going to go through a couple of those um, kind of additional considerations, I suppose. So when you're deciding to go with the pre allocation approach, I suppose you just set up your, your data and your systems, your processes to, um, to allow for that PAA approach. So just your UPR minus your acquisition costs. But if you're doing this eligibility testing, which really has to be done on an ongoing basis, it's not a once-off exercise like transition, you also need to have a process then set up to calculate the L4C under the building block approach which means you need cash flows, you need a risk adjustment related to unexpired exposure uh, and so on. So there's additional data requirements associated with this test and additional work involved. Um, if you compare this then with the BBA, like if you decide to go with the BBA, there's no proving required. You don't have to prove to your auditors why you didn't choose the PAA approach. Um, another thing to consider here is that although you might meet eligibility criteria at this particular point in time, what if, say, in five or six years' time, you decide to start writing a uh, business in a different jurisdiction with very different interest rate environments? Would your contract still meet eligibility testing in that scenario? And if, if they don't, then that means you're going to need a whole new process to carry out your building block approach, to develop a CSM, and all the associated disclosures and reconciliations with that. Uh, so I suppose it's just something to keep in mind um, that obviously it's a situation you don't want to find yourself in in five years time. Uh, in terms of the financial impact then, so we're not expecting there to be really any, uh, any significant financial impact at all because the whole point of this eligibility test is that there is no significant difference between the two models. Um, owners contracts, we've talked about this already, so very similar to the eligibility testing. Again, you need a process for your developing your LF4C. Uh, you need to define what these facts and circumstances are. Um, any kind of calculation engine that you have needs to be able to store and apply these uh, facts and circumstances metrics to define whether or not a loss component needs to be set up. Um, again, you know, different sets of data are required uh, versus kind of your normal quarter to quarter reporting process. So I suppose one of the things to look at maybe, um, and it's something that we've done uh, a couple of times for different companies in the past, is to look at, well, under current IFRS 4, what proportion of your book is onerous? Um, and that will give you a sense as to how relevant this area is for you. You might find that only 5% of your book at the minute would be defined as onerous under IFRS 17, in which case this really isn't a significant consideration for you. But there are companies out there that could have 20, 25% of their book 
unknowingly being owners. Um, and actually then this is a very significant requirement for them because they'll actually have to um, set up this loss component on a pretty regular basis. Um, so it's, it's something worth considering. Um, from a process perspective, there is absolutely no doubt about it that the PA is definitely easier to implement. Um, we all know the UPR acquisition costs are very familiar with the metrics. Um, but I suppose in making that statement, we're assuming that the PA applies for your whole book. Because I suppose the last thing an actuarial team wants is to be running two models. So the BBA for one portion of their book and the PA for another portion of their book. Um, so really, I suppose this is one of the things that we're finding companies looking at is, well, what portion of my book requires eligibility testing? What, you know, am I actually going to be able to get my entire portfolio through the, the pre allocation approach? If I can, then great, I'll go with it. But if not, should I just actually choose a building block approach and apply it to everything? rather than having to run two completely different processes. Um, in terms of your data requirements then, so I think we've kind of touched on that um, uh, before. So I suppose the liability for incurred claims, we know is the exact same, exact same data requirements. Uh, the liability for main and coverage under the BBA, the additional things you need are probably your coverage units, obviously anything you need for your CSM. Um, but then I suppose things to remember are for eligibility testing and owner's testing, you still actually need some some of the data elements for the BBA anyway. Um, one of the things that I suppose companies are, I suppose I'm hearing companies saying a lot is, you know, I don't want to have to explain why the CSM has moved between one reporting period and the next. Um, I don't want my CFO to be asking me what, what like, you know, what, why is my CSM moved? Is some of it due to interest accretion, some of it due to amortization and so on. Um, I suppose it definitely is more difficult to explain than a change in your LFRC for the PA which is just, you know, change in premium, change in acquisition costs. They're all items that we all know and kind of understand. Um, so it is absolutely a fair point, but I suppose probably one of the things about IFRS 17 is that it does require an education. It is a different standard um, and, and it, you know, it will take a bit of getting used to for sure. Um, and so the, other, the other thing to think about is that if you have, say, um, an IFRS 17 calculation engine in place that is producing your disclosures, your reconciliations and so on, you should be able to leverage that calculation engine um, to help you explain those movements between the CSM from one reporting period to the next. Um, so you should be able to set up your reports, your reconciliations, your AOC in such a way that it makes that easier for you. Um, finally then, just on the reinsurance part, so just to note that your eligibility testing is separate for your reinsurance contracts. Um, so even if you meet eligibility criteria on the insurance side, you might necessarily meet it on the reinsurance side, which will clearly lead to a mismatch between your, your gross and your net, um, or sorry, your gross and your reinsurance, and again, leads to the same point around running different processes, different models by the same actuarial team. Um, so I suppose in terms of the factors that we're seeing uh, impacting this eligibility test, probably the number one thing is discounting. Discounting seems to be having the biggest impact um, on your eligibility test over everything else. Um, so again, that just comes back to the same point around if there's a change in the interest rate environment, if you're writing in a different jurisdiction, will you really still meet eligibility testing going forward? Um, risk adjustment, probably not so much, um, just because it's generally a relatively small proportion of your liabilities um, and therefore um, you, you know, doesn't really have that big of an impact on your eligibility test. Um, your amortization pattern is another one to look out for. So I suppose the default on your, under the PA is to just use the passage, passage of time. But if you actually, uh, I suppose that's not mandatory, first of all. So if you decide to just use the same uh, metrics as your coverage units under the BBA, that again will bring your BBA and your PA uh, measurements that, that bit closer again. Um, in terms of, I suppose, uh, what different insurers are choosing, um, if it's just a pure non-life insurer or a pure life insurer, it's relatively straightforward and that non-life insurers are pretty much going for the PA if they can. Uh, life insurer is going for the building block approach or the VFA, whichever is, is most applicable. Um, for composite insurers and reinsurers, it's probably less straightforward. Um, so I suppose for those two buckets of companies, uh, generally they will, have to have, they, will, they will have to apply the building block approach for some of their book anyway. Um, which means they'll have a CSM calculation engine anyway. Um, so they're kind of feeling, well, do I really want then to introduce the pre-allocation approach, which is another model, 
will it not just be easier to apply the building block approach just across the board and leverage that CSM calculation engine that's there anyway. Um, so I think I'll skip through that. So just the final thing then is around disclosures. Um, so just picking out kind of, I suppose, the different um, disclosure requirements between the PA and the building block approach. So I suppose this table gives you a good indication as to which ones are applicable for the PA and which ones are applicable for the building block approach. So in general, any disclosures relating to the CSM or any associated reconciliations are not applicable for the premium allocation approach. Um, there are three additional disclosures for the PAA, um, and that's just around which of the criteria of the eligibility criteria have you satisfied, have you met an allowance for discounting, and what decision did you make around amortizing or not amortizing those acquisition costs. Um, so in general, the disclosure requirements are definitely less onerous for the PA versus the BBA. And I think Dara will probably talk, talk about that a little, a little later on, actually now. <laughs> uh, so yeah, with that, I'll hand over to Dara. Okay, um, I'm currently recognizing my last component in that I have one minute to do 10 minutes work. <laughs> um, <laughs> So basically, I just want to take a quick uh, uh, non-life. Uh, someone has some some motor and some construction. So we have a, a one year and a three year, and we have a, it's 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 a reinsured there as well. Um, so in terms of IFRS seventeen, the challenge we have there's a lot of stuff talked around. You know the the CSM and that sort of stuff. So we have this idea of what I would call calculated cash flows and actual cash flows. So the actual premiums and premiums and claims and and everything that's coming through. Um, it's a important at the start of your, your, your project to kind of try to identify what actually needs to be associated to a cohort and, and maybe what doesn't need to be associated to a cohort. Um, also to understand that in the insurance cohorts, you don't have your reinsurance cash flows, but the actual uh, reinsurance treaties you hold, you set up cohorts for them. So uh, you're still basically doing the IFRS 17 for the, for the reinsurance. It's, it's, it's not missing from it, so to speak. Um, and ultimately your challenge is to try and get everything from the bottom uh, group it in the middle into your your cohorts etc and apply it up to your your, your business lines and then uh, report then at a, at a company level at the top um, kind of as people have noted earlier on there um, whilst you'll be doing the the financial statements at the, at the company level it's ultimately you will end up either for internal or external reasons uh, reporting things kind of at that portfolio or line the business level um, and then when the numbers are kind of not what you want them to be or expect them to be at that level. Um, if you have designed an architecture that basically can do almost a, a balance sheet and PL at the cohort level, it's much easier then to find out where things have gone wrong. Um, so, you know, where possible from the outset, I would try to take a bit of pain now to save yourself a lot of pain and whatever Q1 2022 or 2023 uh, when someone's saying uh, how are we getting this profit how are we getting this CSM and you have uh, three hours to tell me why it's not what I wanted to be and try and figure, figure it out so unless everyone wants to be working very late uh, in, in those quarters going forward uh, try and figure that out now um, much of this we, we, we've covered before so look you identify your portfolios similar risk manage together motor construction uh, you then decide are they are they onerous or not and then separately, if you have uh, reinsurance, you then go and set up the, the cohorts for, for reinsurance. Um, so again, one thing I'd encourage people to do, it was Lewis earlier on, is um, have a look at all, all of the actual cohorts you're gonna set up. So if you decide uh, what makes up uh, a cohort, go off on Excel and just put that together and maybe go back for, for, for three years and see uh, with three years business, how many different cohorts you actually end up with because that's going to be your challenge going forward is to, is to manage all that information and to get those actual and expected cash flows assigned against those cohorts and to keep all that going forward over time. So before you uh, write and sign off your paper to say, this is, a, this is how we're doing cohorts, give, give it a go in, in Excel and see what you, what you come up with and then try and think to yourself, well, you know, the balance between having all of these cohorts and being able to identify the exact numbers when my top CSM isn't what I want it to be, or not having all these cohorts and then how much noise and things banging against each other are actually in that CSM. And you want to get that trade off between uh, the complexity versus giving me the numbers I want when someone's knocking at my door asking for them. Um, then kind of like the CSM again, sorry for everyone at the back, this is re really small, but 
does it does an accretion over time for the liability for remaining coverage then or, or kind of how it evolves from an opening to a closing so you have your premiums coming in you have then some discounting then the next red is your acquisition cash flows and amortization of the acquisition cash flows you have your uh, releasing your uh, insurance revenue so your own premium reserve uh, and then any investment components and then you're back to your closing balance so i have some cash flows here we have say a one-year motor um, we have oh, 100 grand in premiums and um, we've 10 grand in acquisition costs and we've uh, 20 grand in total across the year in, in claims and, and five grand in other expenses so our liability for remaining coverage and um, we can see in the bottom left the different elements we have that acquisition cost of two and a half grand and um, because this is less than a year you can recognize that as incurred so you could just put the 10 grand in straight away and um, as joanne alluded to basically the the, the PAA and the general measurement model, they should be giving you the same answers. And they give you the same answers if discount rates are low and if the variability of future cash flows is, uh, is, is, isn't wide, is, is, is tight. So um, they're gonna be, that's going to be one of the things that's going to kind of drive out whether you can use the, the, the PAA. Um, so very briefly then, uh, someone said on the three year. So uh, now we have to bring in basically discounting. So for the one year, we don't have to have to discount the cash flows. Uh, for anything over that, we, we do have to discount. We can still apply the, the PAA, even if it's three or I've seen people with five years applying it, because again, interest rates are low and the variability of cash flows is, uh, isn't is wide. And so they it's gonna give the same answer. So that's kind of, as we say, fine for now. What are you gonna do in, in five or 10 years time? Are you gonna have, then have half your business on PAA and half your business on the general measurement model? Um, Ultimately, again, it's the same type of thing. So we bring in our cash flows. This time we have discounting. This time we have to amortize the, the acquisition uh, cost. So that's the third last column. And then we have the revenue uh, accreting in over time. Um, what's useful, this is an accounting standard. So it's a very, I think it's very useful um, for the actuaries to figure out, well, I'm working out this liability for main coverage. Where does that actually go? So if I picked up my company's uh, financial statements at the end of the year, I produce the numbers that go into that. Where do they actually appear on it? Um, so that, you know, when you're asked a question, you, you, you can trace it back from actually what it's, what it's being used for. Um, so on the P&L side, on the IFRS 17, we have our insurance revenue, our insurance service expense, and that gives us our insurance service results. And then we have our investment income and our finance expenses. And some of the finance expenses can be, down, can be in the profit or loss, or else they could be in the other comprehensive income. And so wherever they are, we add them on, and then we get to our total comprehensive income over on the left. On the balance sheet, we're, uh, we have our uh, assets and our, and our liabilities, and under IFRS 17, our reinsurance and our insurance uh, are, are, separate, are separately identifiable. So for the last one, the, the 100 grand example, we have premiums received at the top. What do the accountants do with that? It's cash, and it's the insurance contract liabilities. Our acquisition cash flows, cash, uh, the, the liabilities as well and our direct expenses then. So neither of those two things have, have actually hit the, the p and uh, When we get expenses in, we hit them in cash, we do hit the p and And then the next step then, the liability for remaining coverage, we're gonna accrete this into the p and over time. So you'll see in the, the second box, there's a P&L and a balance sheet. The, the L there stands for liability uh, in the, the third last column. So on all of these, we have basically, we've taken in our premiums and we've uh, set up a liability for them. And now we want to uh, tick that liability down and put it into the PL effectively is what's happening. But for our different cash flows, they go to different places. Um, so our interest will go into the insurance finance expense, which is over on the left is whatever the uh, third or fourth box, depending on, on the coloring. Um, we have our, our amortization of the acquisition cash flows. That's going into the insurance service expense, which is the second box up on, up on the left. And then we have the unearned premium reserve, so the, the, the profit we're recognizing, um, that's coming into the top line, the insurance, uh, the insurance revenue. And then as Juan said, that's um, for, for the kind of the future coverage. Then if we have some claims, um, we then have to set up a, a, a present value of the, the, the claims. Um, we have a, a risk adjustment as well uh, for the expected variability in, in the claims when we actually come to pay them. If they're more than a year, we have to apply discounting. In this case, I'm just saying, we've incurred five grand and we're gonna pay it in the year. Um, so I'm gonna set up uh, five grand then uh, as a liability. Um, and on the P&L side, I'm gonna see my insurance service expense for that. 
and then on the uh, on the risk adjustment, uh, likewise, I have my uh, contract liability and my uh, insurance service expense. And then when I actually come to pay that claim within the year, then uh, I'll write down my uh, my liabilities and I'll see it come into cash. Um, and then I'll uh, write down my risk adjustment as well. So part of actually the what's just interesting is that um, on the the cash flows, the majority of cash flows aren't hitting the the P and L. The kind of cash flows set up or uh, or decrease your liability, and then what hits the P and L is how you move that liability into P and L over time. Um, very quickly, then uh, almost last slide here. Uh, what I would say is. When you come to the Y for 17, especially for the project lead, so the people that aren't just doing the liability for remaining coverage, so there'll be a lot of uh, people in, in the room who are actually kind of helping to deliver a whole project here. Um, and when it comes to cohorts and kind of uh, what you're using to aggregate all the information, be aware of the, the management information that, that is currently being provided um, and just make sure that when you set up uh, your various cohorts, do it in a way that you don't end up calculating the numbers for the, for the liability for remaining coverage or CSM. And then trying to like uncalculate or disallocate them uh, into various uh, um, kind of like whatever uh, motor by uh, by sales channel or anything like that. However, you currently do your MI reporting, try and get everything done at the same level. So you do it once; it's there. Uh, it's easy to see. Everyone can see what, what they need out of it, and you're not doing things uh, multiple times in multiple different ways. And then when an input changes, I've got to redo all of my other things again, um, and. Just be aware of the uh, account code being, being a key thing. That's how the accountants have tell what's going on. Uh, is there a account code? So make sure when you, when you uh, create a new structure that you fit in line with what they, what they currently do. Um, that's the end of that there. Thanks, John. Well, maybe in the interest of time, I know we had a lot of content there and the slides are available afterwards for the small print. Um, so. I think perhaps we'll look at questions.